Yes. Great. All right. So I'm Robert J. Schwab. Uh, I'm a game designer. I worked on uh, Dungeons and Dragons for uh, a number of number of years, including the newest edition of D and D Fifth Edition. Uh, I have recently, uh, well, before that, I also worked on Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, uh, Song of Ice and Fire Roleplaying, which is based on George R. R. Martin's books and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, at GMX this year, last year, I announced uh, I was designing a new role-playing game called Shadow of the Demon Lord, and uh, we have been doing a lot of promotion stuff to kind of build it up over the last few months, and we Kickstarter launched in March, uh, last March, this is just, uh, I guess, 24 days ago, and the Kickstarter's blown up kind of a bit. Uh, we funded in six and a half hours, and we're right now closing in $100,000 and climbing, so A+. Plus. So here, um, today I'm just going to talk about the game a little bit and then answer questions and then we'll, uh, we'll hug it out at the end and be good to go. Uh, so how many of you guys play role-playing games regularly? All right. Uh, and how many of you, uh, I guess, th those of you who don't play role-playing games regularly, you're interested there, right? Because that's why you're here. Totally. All right. No, she's here because I dragged her. Oh, oh see, you're going to be a gamer right now. Let's go ahead. We're going to get you in. What's that? We're going we're gonna to make it happen. We're, it's going to be magical. All right. So the, the thing that I wanted to do with Demon Lord was that there are a lot of fantasy role-playing games out there, obviously. In fact, we have 30-plus years of fantasy RPGs that you can go and pick up at a used bookstore and have that kind of experience that you want, right? But I think that there are some things that RPGs don't do because we're stuck in the same kind of design philosophy that has dominated game design for years, especially in tabletops. And one of those is the open-endedness of the campaign. The idea that you'll play, that you get your big book and you're going to be playing this game for 20 or, or well, 20 years or longer, right? You're going to play your campaign for three or four years and, then, and it always peters out. So there's that kind of feel-bad moment when your campaign doesn't kind of hit its, its thing. The other thing, too, is the expectations about how long sessions last. Uh, we, you know, you sit down to play an adventure, you get a big, scary, big box adventure, and you're going to play that same adventure for six, seven weeks or seven game sessions. Well, what happens from you play the first game session and you got everybody there, the second game session, usually missing a person or two, and the next one you might add a person or two, and then every time you're playing the game, you're bending the narrative to accommodate the fluctuating attendance, which is deeply annoying. And a lot of us gamers just kind of work around it, right? We just put the blinders on and ignore it. But it's a problem. And it's a problem because it, it's that kind of constant revision that, you, that, you, that, that erodes the confidence in the campaign and the play experience. So those are two of the things I really have been fighting to, to overcome. So how I did that uh, was to say, screw the idea of a two-year-long campaign and say that you can play a campaign in 11 game sessions. Uh, and then every adventure you're going to run is a self-contained play experience. So you get together with your friends, if you've got three to five hours to play, you can play a full adventure in those three to five hours. Because you know the thing is, if you play for more than four or five hours, you lose the attention, you've lost the attention spans you're already playing anyway. So it's usually a good kind of safe zone. So that means that you play this game for 11, se 11 sessions, 33 to 55 hours of gameplay, you completed a campaign. Now that gives you some other benefits on the side. If you're, the, let's say, this is our gaming group, right, and you're the game master, uh, you run your 11 sessions, you're done you want to run, you can either tie into that story and it gives you a chance to run 11 game sessions and you can do the next thing. So that means that four campaigns or more a year and that's super powerful because it means you get to play the entire, you get to see more of the game than you normally would, right? If you make a character in another game, you're kind of locked in that character for as long as you're playing. This lets you play multiple characters and keep playing and, and do some other fun stuff. So that was a kind of the, that was a high level uh, structure of the design that was really kind of pushing toward and we've achieved it, uh, but now it's, uh, you know, that's, now, that, that, anyway, that's, that's the main part about that. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do was, I wanted to lower the barrier to entry for role-playing games. Uh, you know, if you, you're long in the tooth like I am, uh, you probably have the patience and wherewithal to dig through a 300-page book and kind of digest all that stuff, and you like to have a lot of tar po toys and moving parts. But let's say that you are sitting down to play a role-playing game for the very first time. Which would you prefer, what experience would you rather have? Here's a stack of books this tall. Read that and make a character. Or here's one book. Read read this little section of that book and make a character. Which one would you rather do? Uh, I thought so, right? So what we do for characters is that we one of the things I wanted to do for character for character creation and for players was to eliminate all that stuff that that we we accept as gamers about making characters. Uh, when we were doing 5th edition design, uh, one of the things that was interesting was talk we, one of the things we kept talking about was building your character with buckets. 
uh, you've got four or five different buckets of mechanics that you're digging into to make a uh, third edition or fourth edition character. We'll take fourth edition since that's more recent. Uh, in fourth edition, when you make a character, you make a choice of your race. You make a choice of how you allocate your ability scores. You make a choice about your skills. You make a choice about your feats. You choose your powers. You choose your equipment. Eventually, you might choose magic items. That's seven different buckets that you're drawing from to build your character. And that's a lot of complexity because you can have a lot of, and there are a lot of pitfalls in that design because that's, there's, there's this idea that skill focus is the same thing as weapon expertise, which isn't true, right? Uh, but they, they occupy the same box, right? So that's a choice that you can make, which means you make a poor choice, you have a feel-bad moment in gameplay. So what we do for, what I did with Demon Lord was I just got rid of all that. It's all gone. Instead, you're building your character as you're playing. Every time you, make, every time you play a game, you're making another decision about your character or you're getting a benefit for your character. What that does is it allows you to slowly figure out how all your stuff works and so you get mastery as you're playing without having to make a bunch of different choices. So let's say we'll start, we'll start with our game. The very first game we're going to play is going to be a more Call of Cthulhu style gameplay because you don't have a lot of choices. You don't have, you're not going to have a lot of powers. You're not going to be a badass. You probably shouldn't go fight any orcs. You should probably not go try to summon that demon. You should just go, you're looking around, you're trying to deal with problems, and you're very fragile. You should go for the goblins. Go for the goblins. But not, also, cool. but, but not always. You could also have like a gigantic demon creature that is just stomping around, but instead of going to go punch it in the face, you might go try to find the ritual that will send it back, right? Yeah. Um, so this big choice you're going to make at, at, when you're making your character is, like, is your ancestry. Uh, will you be a human? Uh, are you going to be a clockwork person? Are you going to be a hell-spawned devil per cambion? Uh, or an angelic defender of the cosmos? Or something along those lines. And you're just a person in the world, and you're working, in, and what you're doing in this first adventure is you're dealing with a problem, but most importantly, you're forming your group. Because your group, because all role-playing games posit that you are playing an ensemble cast of characters, right? Like, like Firefly. You're a group of people that work together to overcome problems. Uh, this is your origin story for your team of, of characters. So that first adventure you're playing through, you do all your stuff. Now at the end of that adventure, your group forms and your group gains a level. Uh, at level 1, at level 3, and level 7, you make a big choice about your character, which is called your path. So at level one, you think about what you did in that first adventure. So let's say you spent that first time as, what, what, let's say, dwarf. Let's say your dwarf spent that first adventure kicking ass and taking names. You punched a few people in the faces and you kind of helped protect the, your, your friends. You have a choice of four things. You could be a magician, a priest, a rogue, or a warrior. Warrior seems like an obvious choice for you, right? Since you just spent your time pounding people in the face. Maybe, maybe you go priest, but we'll say, we'll say for, the sake of, uh, for the sake of example that you went the route of warrior. You, however, found this scary tome wrapped in barbed wire and human skin, and there's a tongue nailed to the face of this book, and every time you read aloud from this page as the tongue flaps against the cover, you decide, I've got some magic mojo going on, I'm going to go into the path of the magician. How's it going? I'm good, are you? I'm not bad. Is Yes, it's 10.30. Are you already started? We just did. Okay. Is there people outside waiting? No. Uh, well, a couple from the other panel, but yes, there are all of them. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, so you make, you make the choice of magician. So now you're a magician, you're a warrior, you go priest, and let's say you go rogue. And so now you've got your group, and you've figured out what you've done because you've already you looked at what your characters did in that first adventure. There's not like some sort of coding about you have to do, if you do this, you do that. You freely choose whatever you want because you get to play whatever you want to play. Now, if you, if you choose to be a warrior, your group goes to your first two adventures. At level one, you get benefits. At level two, you get benefits. And then you make your next choice, which is your expert, expert path. What the expert path does for you is it either lets you refine a previous choice you made or take your character in a completely new direction. Uh, so let's say uh, you're the warrior again, but this time you have some sort of religious epiphany. You encounter one of the spirits of your ancestors, and now you've been charged with uh, carrying out this mission. So you decide you're going to go like to a holy warrior path, which gives you some magic to kind of supplement your fighting abilities. But let's say you, however, discovered this crazy rune sword that has a spirit of some demonic creature inside of it, and every time you swing it around, it screams. You might go into the path of like champion or or, um, or spellbinder to to unlock the power of your weapons. So now you've actually diversified your characters, where a priest might just go on to become a cleric or a druid or whatever. So what that does, it, let, it lets you. So, but none of these have requirements. It's all the, all requirements are the ones you set for yourself. That you were kind of making these decisions about how you want to build your character. A couple more levels later, you're going to make your master path choice, and I that's the icing on your character's cake. And that lets you drill in to do one thing you do really damn well, which might be I'm really good at casting air spells, or I might be really good at chopping people up with a huge giant axe. 
uh, and you can bolt those on whatever way you want. So by the time you get to 10 levels or 11, 11 sessions of gameplay, the core book will give you options to build, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 3 million unique characters by just putting those pieces together and choosing your spells and doing that stuff. So that's kind of the structure of the game. So what's happening is though that you you get a little bit you get you get a little piece you're adding to your character every time. So you're building like this puzzle piece thing, and you're just drawing from a different box of puzzle pieces when you hit one, three, and seven. And because you're normally like if you multi-class in D and D, you're kind of screwing yourself because if you make a bad choice and you're kind of then have to play catch up. What this does because your novice path gives you the most benefits, it insulates you from making a suboptimal choice. You will if you choose warrior, you're always going to be pretty solid at fighting, and you're always able to hold your own. If you choose Magician, you're always going to be damn good at casting spells. If you choose Priest, you're going to be great at helping your buddies. So that's kind of the structure of how the game plays. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I, let's see. We'll tell you about the game system itself, and then I'll let you guys throw some questions at me. The game engine works. Uh, one, of the, one of the things I wanted to do was I wanted to make a game that I could run when I was a little drunk. To be clear. Just, I, I wanted to be, that I didn't have to stress about. I, didn't have to, I could go in, pick up, and play. I've talked about how adventures are designed to be played in just a couple of hours. Uh, how we do this is that I've discovered that for every page of text in an adventure, you get an hour hour's worth of gameplay. That means you're, all adventures are two to five pages long. That means that you can read two to five pages in 15 minutes and be prepped for your adventure. They're just bare bone stuff, and you fill in the connect, you, you create the connective tissue that links that adventure to your group links adventure to what happened before, and also plant seeds to come with, come with later. You're never going to find adventure hooks in, in my adventures. You're never going to find exhaustive backgrounds or, or extensive world building. Part of that is because I want, I trust game masters to do that for themselves. And if you want a beer and pretzel style game, you don't need that crap anyway, right? Uh, so uh, the gameplay is very simple uh, in the sense that I wanted you guys, I wanted people to be able to migrate for easily from other game systems and play this one. So you've got to play D&D. This game does play differently, but you, you will know how to play this game. So uh, your, all your task resolution is, is handled through a D20. Uh, there are three possible outcomes, yes, no, maybe. Uh, the game incentivizes or encourages game masters to say yes, because we want to keep the action moving forward. Walk across the room. Do you need to make a roll? Absolutely not. You walk across the room. Uh, the game also says that there's a big wall, and there are plenty of handholds, and you have plenty of time. Guess what? You're going to climb that wall. There's no need to make a roll. Why? Because it's not interesting if it fails. Think about the Cirque du Soleil dancers when they come out every night to do their performance. Is there a 5% chance that one of them is going to screw up? No. no. It's not, they're going to do it the same way they've done it week in, week out. Why? Because they know what they're doing. And so the game suggests that your characters know how to get around and how to do things in the world. So rather than put you through this engine of where you're tossing dice to do whatever you want to do, the game just frees you up to say, hey, I'm going to, see, I'm going to open this lock with my lock picks. You open the lock with your lock picks. We move the story forward. When it's unclear, when there are situations where the story is not, where it's, what's going to happen next is not quite certain, uh, the game master can call for a roll. And some instances where this would be, uh, this comes to play is, you're going to attack the guy with your battle axe. What happens? I'm a priest. You're a priest? But you still, well, you're a priest, you still can smack with a battle axe, right? But what, what would it, we don't know what happens next. Uh, you'll have to make a roll to see what happens, if you hit or not. Uh, you're going to try to climb a wall, but there is a gang of de demon-possessed orcs that have paint in their faces white, and they're wearing, uh, they're wearing suits made of chains, and they're shooting rifles at you as you're climbing. Probably need to make a roll. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, so there are two types of rolls, action rolls and attack rolls. If you make an action roll, you throw a d20, you add your modifier from an attribute. If you equal or beat a 10, you succeed. So it, the event happens. Otherwise, you don't, and the event doesn't happen. And you can't retry that event unless you change the circumstances in some way. So that means target number is always 10. Always 10. What's good about that is that means that if you're just tossing the die, you can see that if you've got two numbers on your die and, you don't, and your modifier is at least zero, you know you succeeded. There's no real math that you have to do. You can just look at the dice and pick it up and play. Attack rolls are a bit different. And the reason why is because you're, putting, you're pitting yourself against somebody else. And they're assumed to be resisting you. Rather than have, like, I'm rolling and you're rolling, the game just uses scores in order to be your target numbers. So if I attack you, I would attack with a weapon, I would make an attack roll against your defense score. If I try to push you down to the ground, I might make a strength attack roll against your strength score. Or if I try to convince you to take this bribe, you might, I might make an intellect roll against your willpower score. Does that make sense? All right, so we model difficulty with, uh, rather than having a scaling chart of DCs or target numbers, we use boons and banes to model how things work. So every positive circumstance that would help you, you have a boon. For every negative circumstance that would hinder you, you have a bane. Boons and banes cancel each other out, die for die. 
So once you, once you figure out how many boons and banes you have, you pick, them, pick up a number of d6s that match, uh, and then you throw them with your d20. You add the highest bane or subtract the, the highest boon. Uh, you add the highest bane, boon, subtract the highest bane from your roll, and you find your target number normally. So let's say we're going to climb that wall in that situation I described. You have to climb to the roll, but you're impaired, you're poisoned, and you're fatigued. Three afflictions you could have. Just three banes that are going to be on your roll. So you'd roll a d20 and three six-sided dice. Let's say you roll a two, four, and a one. Uh, you subtract the four from your d20 roll, and then you're ready, to, and you're done. That's all you have to do. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. The last bit of tech I'll tell you about, and then we'll uh, and I'll open you up to questions. Um, combat is uh, one of the other things that's going to be a little weird if you're coming into this from a from a D&D background. And the one thing that I've gotten rid of uh, is the idea of initiative. There is no initiative. Players go first, and they act in any order they want. That seems chaotic, but it, it actually works really well. So what we do with turn, what we do is that I've always had a problem with initiative systems because it feels like it is this it has no bearing on what's actually happening in the game. It is purely there to give you an opportunity to smack the monster before the monster gets a chance to smack you back. What it also does is it encourages spotlight gameplay where rather than we're working together as a team, it's my turn to act. I get to do this moment. This is not, role-playing games are cooperative exercises. You're working together. So to, to kind of get rid of all that stuff about having to assign a turn order and maintain all that garbage, just, we threw, I just threw it out. So what happens is a round has three parts. You have fast turns, slow turns, and the end of the round. Uh, you can act in any order you want, and typically players go first. Certain monsters, like the big scary dragon or a demon, might actually have multiple, multiple actions per round and may act before you. But typically, if you're fighting goblins or rats or whatever the hell you might be fighting, players go first. So you decide on a fast turn, during the fast turn phase if you want to act. If you act during a fast turn, you can do one of two things. You can use an action or move up to your speed. Once everybody has taken a fast turn and has done so, the game master does fast turns for any creatures he or she controls. Then it goes to slow turns. If you've not yet taken a turn, you may then take a turn in any order you want. And if you take your turn on a slow turn, you can use an action and move up to your speed. So it's action or move, or move and, move and action. You only get to act once per round. Unless you do something that says you can't, you can do more. But that's all. That's 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 it. And you do that over and over again until combat ends. Does that mean that seems pretty reasonable? Yeah. And what I found is that uh, I've run this. De I've run demos of this game nonstop for, and I've been play testing for eighteen months almost. Uh, it just it works. So a plus there, right? Yeah. It almost seems like it's like D and D, but like taking all the BS out of it. Yeah. That sort of, well, you know, I, when I started design, uh, I was working on, I was, I was working on fifth, and I was kind of frustrated with some of the, the directions the game was going, and I wasn't sure that it would be a game that I would want to play. But I wasn't also sure what I was going to do down the road, so I started working on a, an engine that I would want to play. And I love D&D, I also love Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. And those are the two main inspirations for this game. I also realized that I don't have the headspace or the will to engage in super complex systems anymore. I just don't want to mess with it. Uh, and I think, I think the climate is actually shifting back towards simpler game systems that are more pick up and play, because we just don't have the time we used to. So I started by making some sort of uh, first edition retro clone, and then as I'm starting to pull away stuff that doesn't, work, that doesn't really work, and started kind of tearing down of the game uh, to its guts, I realized that there was actually a different, and I was starting to build back up, I realized I had to, dis I had accidentally started work on a brand new game. And that was the kind of it started. We put, I put together an alpha pack uh, for the uh, my play test group, and then here we are. So it's got some D and D. It does have D and D in its DNA, but uh, it also has Warhammer. It has Song of Ice and Fire. It's got all sorts of other stuff. Kind of, if you pull it down, look down to the very guts of the game, you'll find that stuff in there. Questions for me? Um. Now you said it's just one book. Yep. Is it like? Do you have a setting that goes with it, or is it just make up as you go? No, nope, there's a setting. Um, so the book right now is 224 pages. Uh, we're doing uh, most of the products that we're going to use to support this line are going to be PDFs. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be selling adventures either individually for like a couple of bucks uh, or in packs um, of three. Uh, and those adventures will give a little bit of setting. They'll, 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 they'll shine a little light on certain areas of the world that involve that particular adventure. Uh, we also are going to do a series of setting expansions like Tombs of Desolation. And those are short 16, 20 page, 24 page uh, bundles. They also give you an adventure, player options, and some system expansion. Uh, we will be doing down the road um, bigger books like uh, the, the Demon Lord Bestiary, 
um, we'll do uh, the book of weird magic. And these are some add-ons that you can that you can use or not. But the core book itself contains everything that players need to have to make a character, everything you need to know to, to run the game and play the game, and then also everything you need to everything you want to kill. Uh, so that's yeah, it has all that stuff in it, and we'll be just delivering everything that comes in. Will be kind of like they'll just like be there will be little, little little packet expansions that you can just add on as, as much as you want. Yeah. Uh, where will you get this book at? Uh, right now, if you pre-order it on Kickstarter, you can get it uh, delivered directly to you at the end of the year. If you go to the PDF option, PDFs will be available by August, September. All right. How much would it cost, though? Uh, if you go in now, you can get uh, the, the the best the best bang for your buck is like twenty four bucks. Yeah. And that gets you a PDF of the core book and the starter guide, which you can print off and give your players what they need to make their starting characters. Um, if you go at higher levels, you can get uh, you get more stuff. Um, the book retail price, I'm not sure yet. It depends what final form is going to be. Uh, right, as I said, at 224 hardback, it's probably going to be closer to 44, uh, somewhere in that ballpark. If you buy it in a store. And. Uh the schedule says you're going to be doing a play test of it later today? Uh, in fact, there's going to be one at 1 o'clock that goes and from 1 to 5, six. and from 6 to 10. Right. Are there going to be full games? Uh, they are currently full, but we can, well, you never know who's going to show up. And I will be, uh, I've got to do, I think I'm doing a signing this afternoon, but we've got a, I've got a game master who's running those over there this afternoon. And uh, you can just go into the analog gaming room, and we'll have a table set up right up front. So you can see, uh, you at least see characters and see it played if they're if they're full up. Yeah. Yeah. So so what you did yesterday with the celebrity D and D, I'm assuming that was the whole. Remote. That was a very stripped down version of. Okay. Because it. So the, those people were just doing it for the first time, and it seemed like. Yeah. No, none of them had played the, that, that version of the game. Yeah, they took it. They picked it up right away, right? Mm -hmm. It was. It, I mean, it's, there wasn't really any difficulty to it. It was just do it. Yeah, and that's kind of the, and that was kind of the point is that I just want to make sure that anybody can pick it up and play. And, and it was really, it was funny. It was nice. Good. It was good very enjoyable. Glad you liked it. Yeah. There's no sonics, right? Uh, there are. Magic is one thing. Okay. Magic is one one thing completely. Now the nice thing about the path structure is that if you find something that offends your sensibilities or doesn't fit in your play style, you can carve it out of your game. I'm you a just, three point five baby. Yeah. I played it for a long time, and then this player came in and goes, "Oh, I'm a son." I'm like, oh, that, that, What's that? And at the end of the campaign, I'm like, "I hate you." Oh, it, that, that was a that, that broke that game bad. Yeah. Yeah. We uh, we had a character called the Smoking Gun, who just uh, he just we had a mind player. Oh, uh, nice. What, yeah. what did the psionics do again? Psionics were mental powers. Uh, in the in D and D's pedigree, psionics have always been in the game, and they kind of go. It kind of draws its inspiration from some of the John Carter and Mars stuff, and. Some of that kind of that mental power -y type thing. And it was always an add-on, uh, so it lived in the appendix of the player's hand, the first edition player's handbook. Um, and it's always kind of had this murky place in D&D &D where it was like, is it magic or is it not magic? And uh, so second edition had a, su su had a supplement, third edition had a supplement. Um, I guess it would be more on the supernatural than magical. Like yeah, that. I'm really glad they got that door open. Um, anyway. Uh, Sonics are bad. Like, if you have someone who knows how to play well, they're not that bad. But yep. Most people read Sonics and go, oh, I can screw a lot of people over with these. Right. So, the, because I was saying that all magic operates the same way, you're still, ca if you cast, you bet you decide how you're, how you're, I mean, if I'm a, if I'm a priest of a cult, in the, a member of the cult of the new god, I might, I may, I might think that I'm actually channeling magic, but I'm still engaging the, the engine for casting spells is the same way if I'm a mentalist or if I am a, a warlock or whatever. So it's like RP. Yeah, you just skin it whatever way you want. Yeah. Uh, I have a real big problem with people dropping out of my games. Yep. I have like a core group of three or four that are there all the time. Is I know D and D at least is made for four to six people. Is this something you can play with like two or three, yeah. or is it? Yeah, totally. Uh, because the other thing about right. I had that, I've had that same problem too. It's always, it's, it's always annoying when you you get a, you've got your D and D group together and you've got a, you're expecting eight people or six people and then three cancel within an hour before you start and then you end up well we can't really go forward because this character is important because the adventure is spilling over. So we solved that problem by just cutting off the adventure's end. But anyway, um, yeah. Whenever, whenever I run into situations, we'd have to play a board game instead. But we got together to play a role playing game. So why would I go play a board game? Right. Uh, this is kind of fits into that that hole that lets you pick up these games pretty easily. Um, as far as play, it's it's calibrated for four. 
uh, all the system math is is built on the expectation that there are four PCs, but you can run as low as two or as much as you want. And part of it is because it's not anal retentive about challenge. So, real quick, let me, one of my bugaboos about uh, is false precision. Uh, there is, uh, you remember the third edition, there was like challenge ratings and the counter levels, right? Did it ever, ever once match your, match your play experience when you're looking at what you have this perfectly balanced encounter based on what the numbers tell you, and then you run it, and the PCs wipe it in a, in a round or two, or they just get utterly ganked? Challenge ratings is a made-up number. It doesn't work. Uh, XP in a... XP in... Uh, Fourth edition was a little was a little closer because you have an expectation that uh, you are that your character regains enough resources that you're kind of resetting your character every time you're fighting. But fifth edition goes back to the same kind of false precision of uh, third and earlier games because it just says that this is approximately what your experience is going to be. Rather than than lie to you, uh, we have difficulty in challenge. You can build encounters relatively easily, but just make it up. I mean, you want to, and you don't want to kill your, you don't want to kill the characters. But characters in most games that operate like this start off with super amounts of resources. As they play through the day, that resource curve goes down. So really, those numbers you're talking about as far as challenge only only actually speak to how the game plays when you are past your initial fight and before you're getting to get wiped out. So it's that middle band. So you have to kind of figure out where you're living in that line. So fights get harder as you go, and they get easier uh, earlier into your day. And then, you, so you look at that, that means those numbers are actually moving targets and it doesn't really help you at all. Yes? Um, for the playtest later today, are, are others going to be able to take part in that? I, I hope so, if we've got room. We had sign-ups yesterday, and I think we were both, both tables were at eight last night, but I always imagine people will drop. Okay. So just get over, just shoot over there uh, before one and you'll be talking about it again? One to, uh, one to five and... Six to ten. Six to ten. And will you be playing, like, levels... Zero through three. Uh, no, we're gonna just play. Uh, we're gonna play uh, level one characters. Um, and what I might do is I might bail on the signing thing and just go over there and see if we can get a second table going. That might be better. Better use of my time. Um, well, like I first started playing with fifth edition and I've liked it so far. Yeah. And the group that I have, besides me, there's like three other people that regularly show up, and then we have like a little side group of about maybe four, like three to four people. Yep that either show up or don't show up. So our group at the comic book shop has become to, like, become to be known as the revolving door group. Right. And, you know, it kind of gets on our nerves so we don't know who's going to show up on what, you know, on what Wednesday. Yeah, it's tricky, right? I mean, yeah. It, and that's a, that, was one of, that was one of those things that just, that, that drove a lot of the, had the structure of the game. Yeah, so, so, like, it's hard for, like, when we're trying to figure out, like, who's at what level, who's got what experience, and who needs to get, like, how much experience to right. get to what. Yeah, the next level. So Demon Lord does not have experience points. All right. Uh, the Game Master tells you, you're, and, because, and your characters don't have individual levels. Your group has a level. Oh, okay. So that means that when your group gains, your, your group, your ensemble cast of characters completes a mission, they get a level. The, the group level increases by one, and then whoever jumps in has a character at that level. Okay. So you don't have to worry about accounting or keeping track of any of that stuff. Yeah. Um, I just recently started a little online five campaign mm -hmm. and I've always I'm actually a big Pathfinder because I was 3.5 but Pathfinder had a few sure uh, I like the archetype idea more so than uh, prestige classes yeah but um, I just started five and one thing five did that I didn't really like was skill proficiencies it's where they said okay instead of having this many skill points here's three skills you can be proficient in and you get a little bit more of your proficiency modifier than all the rest. Sure. I'm not a big fan of that. I'm, like, I'm a scale monkey. That's what they call them where I'm from. And um, I just wanted to get your opinion. Like, how does your system handle skills? Is it just the base modifier? Or uh, yeah. Uh, so I've got, I've got two answers for you on that. Uh, one is an explanation for why skill proficiency or proficiency bonus is a thing. And then the other is how we do it. So I'll tell you first how we do it, and then I'll explain why we do it the other way. My game doesn't have skills. Uh, you have uh, professions, and professions are cues to tell you what your character knows how to do, uh, and they also they're, they guide the game master in making decisions. Why I did it this way was that I didn't want there to be uh, I didn't want there to be too much if you have too much complication, right? 
So in, our, in most tabletop RPGs that have uh, skill systems, and this is one of the things that I think D&D, the big cardinal sin that D&D committed was that you have ability scores, which tell you the basis of your character, and then you have skills, which tell you what your character can do. But the game has always been ability score driven. You always resolve all task resolution with your ability scores, right? That's important. Those should be the most important things about your character. But then you have the skill system that lays on top of that in 3rd edition of Pathfinder that then either eclipses those base numbers, those base modifiers, or in, to the point when it doesn't really matter what your modifier is. So, for example, let's say you have, uh, let's go back to 3rd uh, edition D&D. Let's say that you have an 18 strength fighter. So you're an XG strength fighter, which means you have a plus 4 modifier. When you throw a d20, add your, add your 4 to the roll, happiness ensues. However, if you've got 23 ranks in climb, it doesn't matter what the hell your modifier is. Or what you're wearing, or, in, or even having to roll a die anyway, right? Uh, so what, that's, what, that num what that does is that and it, if you, if you kind of step back from the moving the points around and the, and the, the math side of that, you, can, uh, you see what actually is happening is that you want to get you, you want it skilled to enough where the randomness and the fickleness of the D20 can affect your outcome of your tasks. All right. Another point, you said um, situational, like banes, mm -hmm. say like there's no armor check penalty, but if the dude's in full play and he's trying to yep. run from the lower slip of the wall, that's going to be a bane? Yep. Okay. The game master applies. It. The game master can freely assign boons and banes based on what's going on in the game you. because you're allowing the story to kind of move forward. Uh, the reason why we did proficiency, and I, I'm not a big fan of the proficiency bonus either. I would rather D and D just offload the skill system and say D and D is not about. You can either have ability scores, you can have skills. You don't get to have both. And when you have both, you have problems. I take skills. Uh, and you can totally do skills, right? But imagine, but you know, part of the design goal for my game was not saying to a person, here's 30, here are 30 basically skills, choose where you want, which ones you want to be good at. Rather, I, that seems that's a, that's a long list of things to do, and then you have to think about people who said, well, I've got you know, 18 ranks in history, and so you're having to bend the story to make that character, that player feel special for making a shitty choice. And so you... <laughs> You uh, just offload all that stuff. And plus, there are games that do that. Pathfinder and D&D &D cover skills and that system just fine. Uh, Demon Lord just says, I'm an armorer. And you know what that tells me? I know how to make armor. I don't need a whole complex system about it. I can just say my character goes off to the block, to the forge, bangs out a suit of armor because I spent the coins on, on resources, and, and now I have a nice shiny suit of armor. Yeah? You said you don't give individual experience or anything like that. So do your characters stay static? I mean, do they, they, your group level goes up and you get to choose paths, but do those paths and choices you make? Yeah, uh, so every, your, um, every, time that your, every time that your group gains, your group, the first time your group gains a level, which is level one, and every time your group gains another level after that, you're getting benefits from your okay. paths. Uh, so your character does improve, and there's a fairly steep improvement curve line that you get to be pretty scary by the time you hit level 10. Okay. If you jump in at level 10, it's going to be a complex character. There's a lot of stuff moving on your sheet. You probably know 20 spells. If, you're, if, you, if you went pure spellcaster, uh, and you're, you're, going to, you're going to mow down anything that's in your path, which is that it should be because you're at the top of the game. Um, and there are some choices where, some path choices that give you uh, nested choices inside them. So you might start with, um, if you want to go, if you want a lot of customization, go magician. If you want very little customization, go warrior. Because what do you need to know about being a warrior? I'm going to hit you in the face with my weapon, and I need to know how much damage it does. The only thing that's interesting there is a kind of choice between weapons. Now, that I do say that, but the game's also, it talks about how using boons and banes can modify, uh, the game master can apply those to modify certain types of things. So let's say you're going to try to smack the guy and push the goblin out of the way. I might let you make that attack roll with a bane or two, and if you succeed, you manage to push the goblin away and still make your attack. And that's how you can model it because you're trying, you're doing something to reflect the actual story that's going on. You use boons and banes to to address that. So, is the boon and bane system like kind of when um like if people are doing um what's the word I'm looking for uh a charity D and D game and where people can donate money and then just like a random effect comes into play? That could also sure that could so, so, I mean, is it like an equivalent to that? Uh. I'm not exactly sure, like, well, well, unpack that a bit for me. All right. I was watching a video one time, and uh, this guy who was running um, running a D&D &D game for charity, like, every time someone would donate money online okay, to yeah. it, he would just roll a random effect die. Okay. And so either, like, the amount of monsters would increase, or, gotcha. like, something really bad would happen to them. I think or, you could totally do something like that, but the boons and banes are, are used to model difficulty on tasks. 
Yeah. Uh, they don't have there are no tables attached to them. You just throw okay. the dice with your D twenty to see make a task easier or harder. Okay. Um, how is the, the language system? The language system? Is it based off the intelligence modifier? Uh, you start everyone. Your ancestry, which is your first thing that you start with, tells you your starting languages. Uh, you also get. Um, I talk about professions, uh, so I can be a burglar, I can be a tracker, I can be a scholar of history. Uh, you can make all those kind of high-level decisions. You can, whenever you would gain a profession, you can swap out that profession to gain another language. Literacy is not a guarantee in this game uh, because, sorry, uh, people just not everyone knows how to read in a fantasy world. Uh, if you go, if you go the magician route, more you're going to be able to read. If you're a priest, you're probably going to learn how to read. If you're a warrior, you need to have a good reasoning. Like you're come from an ability, or that you have a you have a profession that that models that. Uh, is this going to be a traditional fantasy game where it's like traditional weapons, or are there going to be like compound weapons or possibly firearms? Yes, there are. So the game, the, the equipment chapter includes guns because <laughs> gamers want guns, right? I've been wanting the game with guns. <laughs> yeah, we've got pistols. So uh, rather than uh, there is, at one point I had this huge list of weapons, and they all did different. And I realized that's way too much. What I did was I, there's a, there are categories of weapons that are like a line. So a scourge, a small sword, or a sickle, or whatever that fits in that category all does the same thing. They all have the same properties. It can be whatever the hell you want it to be. So a sword and a battle axe, they're the same thing. If you want to have a spine sword with a sickle attached to the end, <laughs> uh, you can totally do that, and it doesn't really change what your weapon does. It just makes it look cool and gives you a good laugh for the audience. You just but, intimidation uh, points. What, what's that? <laughs> intimidation right, points. Right, right, right. You know, in that case, like, check out my cool spine sickle sword. I'm sorry, sweet <laughs> spine cool sickle. Anyway, yeah, you could, uh, that, it could be a situational thing. There are pistols and rifles in the game. Uh, there are also bombs, and there are grenades, and there are scary crossbows. There's a whole tradition of magic called technomancy, which lets you build a cro uh, bolt throwers, which is a crossbow turret. So you start okay. constructing it, and you poop out a turret, and then every round it kind of zooms in on somebody and shoots. Yeah. Uh, I'm liking this game already. <laughs> uh, there are flying. You want to. There are flying ships and air balloons. There's even a locomotive that runs through this. That, that runs this part of the, of the world. Yeah. So it's and part of you know going back to my whole thing was why do we say no when we should say yes? The gamers want guns, and they're freaking games. So just put guns in the fantasy games. We're, I mean. <laughs> We're not trying to do some sort of fantasy simulation where you know you're tracking how many pieces of food you eat per day because no one wants to play that game anymore. Now, is it possible to like? I know what you're saying. You could just like make a weapon look how you want to, or describe it how you want to. But can you modify it to increase its damage? Because that is all modifications for damage increases are going to come from your paths. You all, all power growth comes from your path choices. Okay. Uh, that means that if. You could, and you can tell whatever story you want. Warriors, for example, at level two, uh, all their, they throw an extra D6 for damage for all weapon attacks they make. Now, why is that the case? Uh, it, could it be that you've tricked out your weapon? Sure, totally, that could be the case. Or does it mean I've been doing push-ups for the whole first adventure, and I'm just now super buff? Also fine. Or am I just a badass? That's also fine. Uh, and it's... We, it's all about giving control back to the, back to the players and game masters to tell whatever they want. Yeah, because but without having to give you a, a super complex rule set that you have to navigate. Yeah, because like the like the first game I started playing with the DM, like I was playing I'm playing as a wizard with a quarter staff and I and I was in town. And I asked him, hey, can I buy a bag of rivets and you know install them on my quarter staff to kind of make it like a Japanese kanabo. So it would actually increase the bludgeoning damage like one or two points. He goes, no, you can't do that. Well, so I mean, my, my, I think that because you're looking at an abstract kind of thing, since you're not actually doing hit location and you're not doing damage types and you're not doing those kind of things, I think you can freely add that just to make it cool. It probably wouldn't affect the case of your damage output until you did something in your path that would es that would let you escalate that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how would the system run like damage reduction or magic resistance? Uh, there. No, we're uh, going for the monsters more so than the players. Right. Uh, there are some things that can give you, uh, that let you take half damage from certain sources. Um, but since we don't use damage types, you won't ever take four points of fire damage or three points of cold damage. We just take damage because okay. damage is the operation of accumulating injuries on your character. It doesn't matter what source it comes from, damage is damage. And you describe it whatever way you want. Um. How is like the balance? Like I've played with people that they find like a system that works, especially in four, 
like that's where I started playing D and D. And the few people that I played with, and like I learned to play with in four, they would just min max so ridiculously that they could wipe an entire encounter by themselves. Yep, I hate that. I hate that with a, with a passion that I can I can barely even keep inside of me. I really do hate that. Uh, and Twinkie players drive me crazy. I mean, I understand the idea, but the game engine incentivizes that by giving you all those mechanical buckets to build whatever way you want. So lots of players who are more interested in breaking the game or having their moment in the sun and doing it over and over again is fine, but that's not what my game does. Okay. Uh, we only have one bucket. And if there are busted combinations, uh, you know, you, you're only on the hook for having to deal with that for a couple of game sessions, and then you just don't use that thing again. But there aren't that many, but you're pretty safe. So the overall goal of the game, is it like just to defeat the Demon Lord? No, no good, good, good question. So the, 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 the game posits that, all right, let me back up. In most D&D games, or most fantasy role-playing games, there's one that you're, you're, those, those stories point towards one significant endpoint thing. And that endpoint can be orcas crawling out of the abyss, it could be the zombie apocalypse, or anything you want it to be. But it's this really big signature event that will change your world. But you never get there because it takes you two years to play. Rather than put that in the distance, we pull it forward and it's the setting in which you're playing. This cosmic devourer of universes, the demon lord, is lurking in the void between realities. And he's coming through. And as he draws closer, he casts a shadow upon the world and all sorts of terrible things happen. Zombies rise up, there's, a, uh, there's some sort of global pandemic, uh, magic gets corrupted, whatever you want. Uh, and that could be a, something that the players are dealing with. So what you're doing in your 11 session game is stomping around in that world. The best part of the campaign, you get to play in that world every time you do it. So if you, if you go back to, like, if you, do, are you familiar with Eberron? Not really. All right, uh, Eberron has says that there was a last war, and the last war was like World War I in a fantasy setting. But it happens in the background. It happened in the past, before you even start playing. So rather than do that, we just make that the setting. So you can, and you could be playing to survive. Uh, you'd be playing to stall the imminent arri the arrival of the demon lord to thwart one of the major cultists or a, a nasty bad guy or whatever you really want. Yeah. I'm pretty sure you have more experience with all this than all of us over the years. But um, do you think the rise of the internet and massive multiplayer online games have saturated? Like. Uh, the holy trifecta, priest, warrior, tank, DPS, that kind of ideal. If you think that, do you believe that um, that idea that someone has to be, a, well, I mean, like role, role selection before right. character creation? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I think that, I don't think MMOs invented it. I think it was, uh, they just realized it about tabletop RPGs well, long think, ago. I didn't mean, I mean, I mean, mean they invented it, but the right. idea behind sure. it. Because they kids fight. got into MMOs before they got into a book. Right. They go, oh, this is kind of like WoW or yep. EverQuest. Or you don't have to have, uh, one uh, to avoid that kind of sense that there has to be party parry or uh, balance. Have a, you could all play warriors, you could all play magicians, you could all play priests, you could all play rogues, whatever you want to do. Uh, and that's partly driven by the fact that characters can take care of themselves. They can, they have, there is self-healing and there are uh, means to uh, to not repair die. your own damage and not die. How are we doing on time? Yeah, we're, we've got about 10 some odd minutes left. All right, so a couple more questions and then we'll parachute out. All right. Um, well, one thing I wanted to ask is, like, games that are, you know, the fantasy games that are really popular, like D&D &D and Pathfinder, do you think that they are more so popular than kind of futuristic games like Shadowrun just because they're simpler to deal with? Because, like, the core rule book of Shadowrun is literally, like, an inch thick. Yeah. And I tried to start playing that before I played D&D, &D, and just to create a character, I was like, no, I can't do this, and I just pushed it immediately to so the side. There are two problems there. I think one is when you get into science fiction settings or near-future settings like that, uh, you are, your the sense of world, the scope of the world is much bigger. Yeah. If you ever play a modern game and someone says, I'm going to look up the villain's name, or I'm going to Google the villain's name, and then you have to kind of scratch your head and figure out how you, well, what search result did you come up with? I, I ran a Call of Cthulhu game in the internet age, and it's just like, well, screw this. You know, this is not the game for me. Uh, and if you play a science fiction game, you can go anywhere in, the, anywhere in the galaxy, and rather than have to come up with a town on your own, you have to come up with an entire planet, its ecosystem, and its species, and all that other stuff. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of pressure for a game master. So I think that some of those so science fiction games tend to be, they don't have the same kind of traction because you have to, you have to be the smartest person in the room to run those. But rule set wise though, Shadowrun is a unique, uh, unique monster because when, if you trace its, pedigree, its lineage back to when it came out, it was a semi-simple alternative to what was going around in the thick of second edition, sort of. It was a different game, but it's gotten more complex as player demands 
more Twinkie pieces and objects that I can put together. Yeah, because, like, when um, I saw a thing for, you know, people that want to play Shadowrun, yep. and the guy who was DMing the group, he came and met me at a comic book shop and helped me build a character. It took, like, four hours yeah, to yeah. build. And then when I went to go play, I was kind of confused about, like, how to roll and do all this because there were just so many numbers. Yep. But it was so in depth that he had actually like sketched out blueprint schematics of the building we were trying to infiltrate, where all the cameras were and infrared, you know, trip wires. And yeah. I was just like, "Holy crap!" <laughs> so I noticed. I noticed when we were playing yesterday. Sorry, someone's already asked this, but I noticed when we were playing yesterday, you had role playing like backstory for each one of the characters. Yeah, is that something that is is fairly important to follow to like help the DM with the like with the campaign that comes with it. Yeah, well, uh, so what we do for uh, character creation is that you make your one big choice about your ancestry, and then there are a slew of tables that you can throw dice on to kind of construct your character's backstory yeah. uh, in a random fashion, which tests you, so pushes you beyond your comfort zone if you yeah. want to, or lets you build it in. But what I didn't want to do is I didn't want to give too much focus on backstory because that we're not playing the game about what happened to you. You're playing about the game what's happening to you. Yeah. So those are those are designed to be cues about how to play your character. Uh, like D&D is alignment. Uh, you use these background elements to kind of uh, figure out your character's personality and how you would react to certain situations. Um, whenever PDFs became a big deal, were you, uh, were you okay with that? Did you like that? Or was that a big negative thing? It was a scary thing because it, the piracy, because I, mean, I think people have, some people have an expectation that role playing game, designers of role playing games are just lighting cigars with $100 bills. Uh, <laughs> the margins, the margins, the, uh, the profit margins for producing an RPG are so, so tight that, I mean, if you're, you're lucky to string together 10, 10 months in a year. So when our PDFs and piracy became a big issue, it hurt us just as bad and not worse than anybody else. Uh, so I don't have, and that kind of, that has completely altered, I, you know, I wouldn't really care about music so much as far as the, the piracy that affected them. But when you start finding your books, that, it, it really, it, it bothers me quite a bit. But that said, uh, PDFs allow us to deliver the product in a way that we've never been able to do before. And I honestly think that my business is going to be largely driven by digital sales, just because no one wants to have no one reads, no one buys physical books anymore. I'm a huge book fan. Cause I'm a huge book fan I'm, too. I'm, uh, I didn't own the PDFs, but I partook in the game. They were pirated because I didn't like. Hey, you want to join a D and D campaign? I'm like, sure. I've never done it before, but I've heard about it. Yeah. So I joined, and they had it all on a computer. And of course, I, I I don't support PDFs whatsoever. I like unless it's an official PDF. Right. But mainly, I find them a huge encumbrance if you play a spellcaster. Yeah. You've got to scroll all the way down right. to that another spell. Well, you should print out your spell lists. I yeah. Okay, most, uh, I've been playing since 2.0, yeah. D&D 2.0, and most people, most games start divulging down into a series of player directly versus DM, instead of DM being a godlike creature that just causes the story to move along. Is there any way to stop that? Uh, yeah, uh, first, the... Generally, or my game? In your game. Uh, my game uh, suggests that the Game Master is the player's ally. Game Master is there not to... It's, we don't create a game where the, it's Game Master versus players, because okay. if you do that, the Game Master always wins. Yeah. Always wins. Yeah, very true. Although if, we if, anything, that, if anything, it's just going to make your players spiteful towards the right. game, yeah. and it's not a fun event, it's, it's just butting heads. Right. It's it's like, adversarial relationships are terrible, and 4th edition really, in as much as I liked working on 4th edition, it really created that, that climate, where because you were bound by, there was a right way to play. Uh, my game is, makes, first of all, rule zero, rule zero you are trying to tell a story with your group of friends. You don't want that story to go off the rails or, or, or go sideways. So you need to be their advocate. You need to make sure that you're encouraging them to succeed. Uh, I, I do have a question. What, are you, what were your thoughts on 3.5 when it first released? Uh, I got into the business when 3.0 came out. Yeah. Uh, and so I did a lot of design for 3.0. When 3.5 came out, I freaked the hell out. Because <laughs> uh, it was... There were no one knew what those changes were, and we were producing product for 3.0 stuff and had to stop. And then when 3.5 came out, it was a death, death of a, a thousand cuts because you couldn't say we just changed these four things. They you changed thousands of things, and they're hidden, populated throughout the game. So if you were super savvy with 3.0, it was tricky to go 
to migrate from that edition to the next. Plus 3.5 was a lot easier to break the game. We actually killed a Tarask one time by taking a lot of exploding tiles and paying off a, all the males of a village of small halflings to be eaten whole by the Tarask and then have them punch their tiles at the time, exploding them outwards because his damage uh, generation was only on the outside, not on the end. That's, 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 that's magical. <laughs> well, I think we have one time for one more question and then we'll, uh, we'll transition out. How hard was it for you to, like, I've tried to make, I've tried to make my own stuff because there's stuff that I like in certain games and stuff I can't stand in others. How hard was it to actually keep on task with making your own engine and stuff? So, uh, to, I've had, in, since I've started, since I've started design on this game, I've had 56 drafts. Jeez. <laughs> and, yeah, it is the hardest thing you'll do. Uh, as far as, for if you want to write an adventure, that's, if you want to write a good adventure, that's really hard. Uh, if you want to write a few monsters or a few magic items or a few other bells and whistles, it can be hard. You want to design a game system from scratch, it's like, you, you, will, you will develop a drinking problem. <laughs> <laughs> One more question, anybody? Um, done? Well, in regards to the 56 drafts that you did on it, were they like major changes like throughout, or, or was it like minor tweaks, or like kind of a mixture of both? The day before we announced the game at GMX, I had uh, decided that I was going to get rid of D4s, D8s, D10s, and D12s, and shift it to D6s and revise the game overnight. Um, <laughs> that was a big change. Yeah. Uh, but there are other things where it was just wording things, like uh, we had resistance rolls as one of the things you would do, uh, but this week I dropped resistance rolls and now it's just action rolls made. It's it just a, uh, a terminology change, but it's, a, it's one that is really insidious because it's everywhere. You have to find it in all the drafts and all the files. And I've got 280,000 words of text to sift through, so any kind of change you make like that are, uh, is time consuming. All right, your last question. What's your favorite, most personal, playable character? Like you playing as a character. character. Uh, is it like the, my favorite character ever played? or like You played. Not made in an adventure, but you yourself played. Uh, it probably was uh, an assassin named Hood. Assassins are always And assassins are always my favorite archetype. I think they're just awesome. Uh, and I stole the name shamelessly from somebody else. But I just like the idea of... I just. I like being the sneaky guy who, who is a murder hobo. Stabby, kind of stabby, 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 stabby. stabby. <laughs> Well, thank you guys very much for coming out. Yeah. And uh, swing by the analog gaming room and check it out.